Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to welcome you back to the program again today and thank you for joining us every week at the same time. We just are so thankful for those of you who watch every week and the letters and the emails that you send are so encouraging to us. We love it also when we meet many of you when we are traveling and we travel uh, a good bit. Of course, it had slowed down because of COVID, but it is picking up again. And we'd love to see you somewhere in one of our meetings. And we always keep our itinerary posted on my website. And the website is simply lenhouse.com. And we'd love to meet you and, and just talk with you a few moments if you uh, come to one of our meetings. Uh, let me just also say again that we have been doing the series and we've, we've got over 30 some weeks that we've been teaching on the book of Nehemiah and Ezra. And we're talking about the roadmap to Reformation. And because I've gotten the time to build these things when we're in the TV studio, I can share with you things that I normally don't get to share when I'm on the road because we usually have a three or four day uh, window where we're sharing in conferences or meetings or what have you. Uh, but we're able to just unpack some detailed things. And so I, I encourage you to go to my website because on my website there is a direct link to everything we've aired to date is archived there on our website, on our YouTube channel. I, I think that uh, uh, more and more people are watching uh, via YouTube than maybe they are even through television sometimes. But it doesn't cost you anything at all to do that. We have at our website, we have the YouTube. Uh, we have a, a direct link in the upper right-hand corner of my website, which is right there on the screen. It will be on the screen throughout this program. We have uh, up in the upper right-hand corner of that website, there are icons that are a picture of YouTube, of the iTunes podcast, and the RSS feed for Android devices. If you click on them, they will take you directly to our channel and you can subscribe to it. And then every time we uh, upload something, you will be notified. Let me just also encourage you. I don't want to take a long time here to advertise today, but we also have a streaming service for our message of the month club. Now that's a subscription, but if you'd like to be part of a message that we send out every month that we preach somewhere in the world, go to the website and sign up for the digital copy of our message of the month. And uh, it's, it's, it's just a nominal fee for that. And, I, and that, that uh, gift will also help us to take the gospel around the world. Well, we're going to get back in the Word today. We're talking about the old gate. Let me read my text uh, from Nehemiah 3, verse 6. It says, Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Pas Pasea, and Meshulam the son of Basodiah, and they laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Now, we've been talking about in this series, each one of these gates is something that's being restored back to the church during this time of Reformation. I can't take time to review a whole lot here today, but I believe there are some things that the old gate speaks of that we need to capitalize on a little bit. There's some things that I believe that the old gate speaks of. Last week we dealt with the idea from Matthew 13 in verse 52. It said, Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that is a householder which brings forth out of his treasures things new and old. And I, I shared with you last week how I think that their Old Testament is really full of pictures of redemption and how to rightly divide the word of truth is one of the things that we emphasize on this program. But I do not believe, like some people who, uh, who think, well, we don't need the Old Testament at all. No, I think the Old Testament gives us pictures of types and shadows that literally give us a language for how to share the gospel. And I, I shared several examples last week. I'll give you one more this week because as I was thinking about this, the powerful picture in the book of uh, Exodus of the wilderness journey and the Exodus out of Egypt is a powerful picture of redemption because we know 
that the children of Israel were delivered from Egyptian slavery because they took a lamb out from among the sheep and the goats and they put the blood on the doorpost of their houses and took a lamb inside the house in the night rose with fire. And what that blood on the doorpost said to the death angel is not that this house escaped. It said to the death angel, there's already been a death exacted here. The death of the lamb was the death of the firstborn. See, that's a powerful picture of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ who points at John the Baptist points at on the bank of the Jordan River and said, right there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the whole New Testament has an Exodus motif all the way through it. From the time Jesus is identified as the Lamb, clear till you get into the book of Revelation. There's an Exodus motif where he is constantly trying to bring them out of exile and out of slavery. And I I don't want to chase this rabbit, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to a little bit. But one of the things he does in Revelation, for instance, the 11th chapter, is he identifies Jerusalem, the centerpiece of Judaism, Old Covenant Israel, as being Babylon, as being as being Egypt, I'm sorry, Babylon and Egypt, uh, and Sodom. He uses this, he says this in Revelation 11, I believe it is verse 8. He says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Our Lord was not crucified in Sodom or Egypt. Our Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. But the Holy Spirit is identifying where our Lord was crucified as spiritual bondage and spiritual Egypt. And he's talking about an exodus, a deliverance from the bondage of the slavery of a system of religion. I think so many times we have looked at release and freedom from the bondage of the world. And that's absolutely here and the slavery of sin. But we also need to take a look at people being set free from the bondage and, and, and slavery of a religious system of old covenant thinking that keeps people being slaves instead of sons. It's not an accident that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah speak to Jesus concerning his decease. And the word decease there is the Greek word exodus. So Moses was the leader of the first exodus, but now a heavenly Yeshua or Joshua or Jesus is now on the scene to lead another exodus. And I mean, uh, then the apostle Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, all of these things happened to them, the children talking about the children of Israel under Moses, for examples for us upon whom the ends of the ages had come. And he wasn't talking to us. He was talking about the first century church at Corinth who had come to the ends of the ages. It was the back end of the old covenant age and the front end of the new covenant age. And right where those two ages came together was a 40 year transition period where one covenant was fading away and the other one was coming on the scene, which finally culminated with the destruction of natural Jerusalem and the restoring of spiritual Jerusalem, the destruction of a natural temple and the bringing forth of a brand new tabernacle of which you are a part. He also uses this same typology uh, when he's talking about great Babylon. I've shared this a lot back through this series, but when he talks about Babylon, he several times reiterates to them, in her was found the blood of the martyrs. And, and, and that, that, that these are the days of vengeance that upon you will come all the blood of the martyrs that were slain. And her was found, she was drunk with the, the blood of the apostles and prophets. That only fits Old Covenant Jerusalem because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, when he said, oh, when, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you, that upon you will come the blood of all of the saints. He said, you testify against yourself that you're the children of the ones who killed the prophets and stoned them that were sent to you. And he said that upon you will come upon... He, as, and Jesus prophesied it in Matthew 23 that upon that first century, Jerusalem would come upon them the blood of all that were slain from the blood of Zacharias to the blood of Abel, or the blood of uh, Zacharias to the blood, or blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias, whom you slew between the porch and the altar. And all of the martyrs that would be uh, vindicated as declared in the book of Revelation, where he said, how long, Lord, he said, until those who are killed would be killed. But they cried out and the incense came up and said, how long, Lord, till you do avenge us? 
and he told him to rest just a little while. But that came in 70 AD with the removing of the old Jerusalem and the removing of that old system and the birthing of the new Jerusalem and the new tabernacle. Now we're taking these patterns and these Old Testament types and shadows and applying them from Ezra and Nehemiah and showing you that as Ezra and Nehemiah begin to revive stones out of the heaps of rubbish, that that's what we're doing in this hour is we're trying to bring about a restoration from Babylon because they were in Babylonian captivity and they were they were and, and 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 they had been in Babylonian captivity for seventy years to fulfill the words of Jeremiah, but Ezra and Nehemiah began to lead a restoration as it began to progress through Cyrus and Persian kings and different. They began to establish the city of God once again and the temple of God. That that Old Testament stories of redemption gives us a roadmap to where we're at in this hour. I'm passionate about this. I really believe God is saying to us, arise, let us build. Let's build the old gate. Let's get back to some foundational concepts that can can bring restoration where the church becomes essential again and they become relevant. I think that the problem has been so much that what we've done is we teach the gospel as if it is only relevant to us when we die and go to heaven, rather than being the salt and the light in the earth that can bring about the kingdom of God in the earth and to bring about transformation and restoration and reformation. And I believe God is raising up builders on the wall. And I think one of the things that we're hearing today, even as I talk about this old gate, is we're returning back to the foundation that the apostles and prophets laid, which was none other than Jesus Christ Himself. Let me just read a few scriptures concerning the foundation. There are some things for me, as I think about this old gate, that are just non-negotiable. I just refuse to walk away from things like understanding the redemption through the blood of Jesus. That's non-negotiable to me. It's non-negotiable to me that the power of the Holy Ghost is still real and relevant to the church. It's non-negotiable to me that I believe that God is calling that through the power of the Holy Spirit that we live a holy life. Those are some things, I think there are some things that to me uh, I'm unwilling to back down from. I'm certainly open to truth and there's a lot of revelation and even things that I'm studying now that I'm challenged by. But the truth of it is, is there are some things that there are foundational that if we don't stay on the foundation of it, and I think sometimes we've moved away from the foundation. We've moved away from the cornerstone. We've moved away from our purpose. I I probably shouldn't say this, but I think the church has become way too political instead of being powerful. We've substituted politics for the power of the Holy Spirit. And while I believe it's important to be salt and light and to influence things like that, I think sometimes we're missing the point of what God wants to do in the earth through the church to bring about His purposes in the earth. But Luke chapter 6, verse 48 and 49 said, He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the streams did beat beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9 through 15 said, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building according to the grace of God, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. That's a non-negotiable to me. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, 
Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And so, you know, as I look at some of these things, I think about, you know, these, these texts that he's talking about is that, you know, he talks about a man who is instructed will build his house. A foolish man builds his house upon the sand. And when the waves come, and when the storm comes, it didn't say if it does, it said when it comes, that house will not stand. But if that house is built on the rock, then when the waves come and the storms come, then that house will stand. I really believe that we have in the last year or so, especially with all the trying things that are going on, i, I got to tell you, man, there are, this has been one of the most in, incredible years of tr testing and trying, I believe, that I've ever seen and experienced for, for everyone, not just believers, but unbelievers everywhere. But one of the things it really has done is made us take another look at what's important. When all of a sudden, man, our smoke machines and our light show and our worship teams couldn't gather, what we start to see is what did we build in people that would make them able to stand when the storms of life come? Did they collapse? Or did we turn back to our faith and say, listen, I refuse to back down from some things. I, I've been built on the rock. And I think sometimes that these things come, not necessarily that God sends them. But what happens is, is that searching begins to take place in our lives. We start to think, what is important here? You know, I, I, you know I've seen so many people. This has probably been one of the most unique seasons. I don't know that I ever know of another day when I've, I've not seen so many people that are dying and passing off the scene, either from COVID or age or even ministries that are great men and women of God that are friends of mine, friends that you know. And it, 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 I'm telling you, at times it can be it can be shaky. It can shake your faith. You can find yourself in a crisis of faith. But what I begin to discover is, even in the midst of this, sometimes the book of Hebrews talks about this. There's some things they did by faith, and then there was some through faith. Sometimes you can by faith shut the mouths of lions, escape the violence of fire. But sometimes there's some through faith. We're like Daniel. He had to walk through the fiery furnace. Where Shadrach, Meshach, I'm not Daniel, I'm sorry, Daniel faced the lion's den, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their faith carried them through the fiery furnace when not a smell of smoke was upon us. I think we're probably in one of those challenging times when there's some things that, I know I'm talking to somebody today, that you're going through some things, but here's the word of the Lord for you. You are going through because you went back to the old gate and said, listen, I'm going to go back to the foundation. I'm going to turn to the Word of God. You know, I, I thought about even as I, I shared last Sunday uh, at my home church a little bit, I was talking about, some, you know, during the times when they would establish these feasts, especially Ezra, he would establish the Feast of Tabernacles, and some of the feast days as they would come into this were days what they would call, they would, they would establish like the Day of Atonement that would precede that. And some of these days were days of fasting and afflicting the soul. Here's the thing I want you to see is that afflicting the soul and fasting to me in the New Covenant doesn't just speak about doing away with food, but the soul, the afflicting of the soul is, and I probably don't have a lot of time to get into this in this segment, but the afflicting of the soul is this thing between our ears. It is your psyche, your soul, your mind, your will, your emotion. The Greek word for soul is psyche or psyche. The English word we translate psychology, psychotic. I think the church has been excellent at sometimes taking care of our spiritual needs, but not so much our emotional or psychological, you know, our psychological well-building. And we truly sometimes are not good stewards of our body, but we are spirit, soul, 
and body. And while we can have our spirit in a good place, I have seen pastors and leaders that are struggling with depression and mental health and struggles in, 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 in their bodies and some things like that. And I think sometimes in the midst of it, there must be a time of afflicting the soul. In other words, sometimes to afflict the soul is not just, or to fast is not fasting from food. Sometimes you need to turn the news off. Sometimes you need to fast from Facebook. Sometimes you need to stop letting all the negativity come that brings you into depression and fear. You need to stop looking at the, the numbers and the nickels and the finances. Paul the Apostle declared, for the suffering of this present time will work for you, watch this, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are eternal. See, these days of struggle will only work for us while we're not looking. In other words, get your focus off of your immediate problem and get your focus on what's happening in the heavens. I was sharing Sunday about how uh, the Scripture says in Psalm 137, By the rivers of Babylon we sat down. We hanged our harps on the, we on the willow tree. They of the captivity required of us of a song, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And they said, How can we sing the song of the Lord while we are in a strange land? And the Lord said to me, What you are singing is determined by what river you're sitting beside of. These people in Ezra and Nehemiah's day were in Babylon. They were in captivity. But here is the same situation we are in today in 2021, is that many times we are still beside the rivers of Babylon, which I've showed you in other segments, is a picture of old covenant religion, and we've got our harps hanging on weeping willow trees, and we're singing doom, despair, and agony. In the book of Revelation, the Bible said that the river, great river Euphrates, which was one of the tributaries of rivers of Babylon, he said, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon to gather people to war. I think if you're sitting beside of the river of Babylon, there's something trying to muster you to get in a fight. But I'm going to tell you it's not time to fight. It's time to beat our swords and weapons into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. Because if you are listening to unclean spirits, you're going to get in the frog choir and you're going to start singing with frogs. But frogs only sing when the water's low. And they live in the marshlands where there's snakes and larvae and flies and, and all kinds of creatures of the swamp. But I'm going to tell you that what I believe what happens is that Ezekiel gets by the river Kibar, which was one of the rivers of, of uh, Babylon. And the Bible said that when he got by the river of Kibar, he said, the heavens were open to me and I saw visions of God. And when he started seeing visions of God, he started seeing a throne and a rainbow. Let me tell you something. We must get beside the river of life in the book of Revelation and our song will change. Because when you start to shift the song that you sing in the book of Revelation, when they started, well, let me just get I'm going too fast. In Ezekiel, he describes this throne room where there are cherubims and a throne and a rainbow and a little book that was opened. And in Ezekiel, the little book that was opened was full of mourning, sorrow, and woe. But if you go to the book of Revelation chapter 4 and you, can, you compare Ezekiel 1, 2, and 3 with Revelation chapter 4, it is the splitting image of it. It has a throne, a rainbow, and a little book. Except by the time you get to the book of Revelation, when that little book is open, they are not singing mourning, sorrow, and woe. There's harpers and angels with take their harps and they start to sing, Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. So I believe what the book of Revelation is about, first of all, is about that God has redeemed us from the sorrow, mourning, and woe. For those who would not receive that, of course, that mourning and woe did come to them in A.D. 70. But what the book of Revelation is about is not just the sorrow and the woe, but the song of redemption that we can sing in the midst of that. And even as we move forward, because we're not sing we're not living in the day of demise. I'm like, I feel like Ezekiel. I've seen the heavens open and I'm I'm seeing visions of God and my song is changing from woe and misery and hanging on a weeping willow tree. My song has changed because the redeemed of the Lord will return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy will be on our heads. Psalm 137 said, we wept when we remembered Zion. Zion is a symbol of the new covenant in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 11, I'm, I'm sorry, Hebrews 11 
No, no, no. no it's Hebrews 12. He says, uh, for we did not come to Mount Sinai. We didn't come to blackness and darkness. You didn't come to the old covenant. But you have come to Mount Zion. And you've already come to the city of the living God. You're not marching to Zion. Zion is the new covenant in the new, in, 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 when you read the book of Hebrews. We wept when we remembered Zion. And because I believe we are standing in an hour, if you're listening to me today, when they of the captivity, the people around you, in your community, in your families, are looking to the church, not to sing the blues, not to get in the songs, not be singing with the frogs in the night season that are croaking everywhere. But they of the captivity are requiring of us a song saying, sing us a song from Zion. Somebody sing something from a new covenant perspective that's not full of woe and doom, but songs that say, thou hast redeemed us. For therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And when you get by that river, it will wipe tears from your eyes. Sorrow and mourning will flee away. That river in Revelation chapter 22 is a river that's full of life. It creates a tree and this tree produces fruit and its leaves heal the nation. It's time to sing, but it's time to sing not by the river of Babylon. It's time to sing because we've got beside another river and we have access to a river that's greater than that river of Babylon. We need to return back to some foundational things and restore the foundation. No other foundation can be laid. When you see it from the perspective of the finished work of Calvary, you won't sing with the frogs. You'll sing with the angels. And Hebrews 12 again says, For you have come to Mount Zion, you've come to the seat of the living God, and you have come to a feastal gathering of angels. It's where the angels take their harps and sing, Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. That's what's going to turn the tide. Well, we're about out of time again this week, but if you would like to so into this ministry to help us continue to declare this message, then please do that. You need to uh, do that today. We really appreciate your help. You can do it by going to my website. There's a place where you can give via credit card or PayPal, or you can call the number that will come up on the screen. If you don't get an answer, please leave a message. We have a limited staff. They will call you back, or you can write a check or money order and send it to the address that will come up on the screen. And your help is needed in this hour as we continue to preach the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of His grace around the world. We thank you for doing that. Consider becoming a partner with us today, and we appreciate it. God bless you. Tune in again next week at the same time. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today. 